Filma. Thank you. Charlotte Bronte, um, 
they're not part of the family, and the only way to get out of this um, of this situation would be either by getting married or actually having an aiding to gain another type of livelihood. Education does provide a route of, for improvement to the characters and their prospects. They can be either they enable them to have better duties, be a better mother and a better wife. It also helps training women for for the future and having emotional satisfaction, but it doesn't help them to get out of that sphere, of that woman's sphere. Um, um, a philanthropist, a nun or minister wife, if they had a, if a woman had a position involved in religion, they've offered a key to such a world where women could be valued for the spiritual worth, if not the material power, where a religious career could give meaning to women's experience and express some of their aspirations, like Hannah Moore. Um, a fourth category would be um, working within the public and outside the domestic sphere. So this would be children and women working in the factories. And other professions would be painters, writers, actors, musicians, musicians and miners, glass engraving, and etc. In this category, I chose Mr. Croft because I think she's a, she's not she's in within the domestic sphere, but she's outside because she goes on she follow, follows her husband on the ship. She's part of this world within within the navy. And when Captain Wentworth tries to argue that women are fragile and should not should be spared from the um, suffering of an uncomfortable journey, uncomfortable being in the ship. She countered that, I hate to hear talking so like a fine gentleman as, and as if women were all fine ladies instead of rational creatures, we none of us expect to be in smooth waters all days. Um, these women that, need, that wanted to work uh, needed training and parents needed to teach the daughters because between the age of 20 and upwards, 43 out of 100 in England are married. And if your daughter says, teach me a trade, you have no right to, to refuse them. That's what Barbara Lee Smith said in Women and Work. Um, I think this is applicable because there's a lot of time where a woman, like it takes a long time before a woman gets married. Or when a woman gets married, her husband could be a poor, or it, she could become a widow. and. Um, in charge of her own children and she has to depend on something, on money. Um, Mr. Elliot is in, the father, Walter Elliot, is an example of this situation because he should apply to this. He should, um, be in, he should be a good influence to his daughters, which he isn't. And since his wife died, his imprudence and insensibility extravagant causes the initial conflict that forces the Elliots to leave and have um, economic problems with money. Um, depending on your ranking, you have these privilege. If you were from the lower class or where you were a colored woman, you had to, the only option you had it was work and gain some money. The working class, um, Dina Craig says the woman's thoughts about women is that the working class includes so many grades from the Western milliner who dresses in silk every day and it's almost quite often quite a lady, to down to the wretch lodging house slavery who were, were the most women that were working like animals. Between the 19, 1841 and 1851, there was an increase of female population, a ratio of seven to eight, and the number of women that returned as engaged in independent industry had increased in poverty ratio of three to four. Um, three millions of, out of six of adult English women were work for substance, and two out of three for independence. Some, even some of the professions such as painting and I think it was mostly painting, um, started to emasculate men. For example, the school design of London closed against female pupils. There's a lot of w women that started um, working outside the women's fur. The only, the only other means which women could improve her social status was by marriage. A marriage is definitely another motif that plays in persuasion. It's not only about love, like the old couple, Mr. Cross and Mrs. Cross. It's also a purpose of gaining social status and having financial benefits. Such as in such cases like Mr. Elliot with his first wife, and Mrs. Clay decided to marry, to marry Sir Walter. She's just only trying to make a better life for herself. And a man's social rank is very important. It's what divided Captain Wentworth and Anne Elliot. 
Lady Russell analyzed um, his social rank in society, his titles, his accomplishments and money, and persuaded Anne not to marry him because he was an unapplicable candidate. A woman's employment could also be important in marriage because um, a man or someone could decide to marry someone who was in the business instead of a poor governess. Um, the Victorian period challenges the meanings of the word domestic outside the work, outside the home and throughout a comparative approach between persuasion and the different types of du duties, the Victorian period maps are an evolution of the woman's duties. In Mary of Reed's chapter, she explores three classes of opinions of where a woman stands. There's one where the woman should stay in the domestic sphere. There's other people that think that they should prove some of the conditions that give them some education, and there's uh, people who think that a woman should have the equal rights, the same equal rights as a man. There's some people that believe that true females stay in the home. There's other people that consider that the transition of a woman, that the transition of a woman from pastime to profession depends not only on the education, intellect, and talent, but more importantly on the force of the character, which I think is a good portrayal of how um, Anne is. And then Dina Malot Craig also was questioning if acting was the real profession. Um, and all, all these things do take into consideration, but by the 1890s, women's function in society was growing, and they were entering a lot of new professions in the public sphere, and there were 3,070 females artists in England and Wales, there were 6,400 actresses, and 22,600 musicians. Um, the best each woman can do is to arrange her own life as best to fulfill all her duties, whether it's through marriage or it's through employment. And that's my bibliography that I used. That's it. <coughs> Any questions? I was going to ask that the, the, you had those four categories, and one of them was uh, there was profession in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. Not, and I was going to ask what could you give examples, but I think eventually you, you did supply some examples. Um, would would the position or the role of the female author would you consider that a profession? Maybe not considered so much in that time, but definitely now it is. It's something. It's like it's like considering domestic rules, like housewife and profession. I do consider it as a profession because it involves something else. Eh? The fact that women write under a pseudonym, or some do, mm -hmm, so yeah. you, that would point, that'd be evidence of that, that, as you said, it's problematic, right? Mm -hmm, yes, because yeah. you know, well, the thing is that, um, like an interesting part that I read and was that I discovered is that a lot of women had a lot of passion to do something outside of the domestic fair, sphere, and a lot of men would laugh at that because it was kind of a, um, a, a romantic idea. Mm. So there was a lot of pressure, and definitely a lot. They're not, they were not very accepted at the beginning, but the, as time changed and as social things happened. That's very illuminating, actually. I enjoyed the talk. Tell me about what do governesses actually do? What is it, what, what's your day to day life if you're a governess? Well, it depended on on how many people you were teaching or um, which class you were about. Technically, um, you had if you had small kids, you would teach them basics, such like you have examples in Jane Eyre, and you have um, examples with Lucy Snow, and you would just teach them painting, drawing, sewing, and uh, languages. Languages. And then, as soon as that period finished. You definitely did not eat with the family. You were isolated, and um, all the men that you actually knew was people that were above you. So you couldn't actually uh, have a relationship or a proper relationship with them. So the rest of the time, that there would probably it depends on every woman, but probably um, 
go to church or just get involved in their own accomplishments with painting or... So the governess is predominantly for girls? And Predom they yeah, boys. predominantly for girls. There's, there have been occasions where there's also boys for predominantly for girls, just because... So they might have oversight of young, of young boys, four or five or whatever. Yeah. But if you're I in a kind I... of upper middle class household or an aristocratic house, then you'd have a, a tutor for the boys, mm -hmm. is that right? Yeah. Who's to teach you algebra and mathematics mm -hmm. yeah. and Latin and, that, and yeah, that so more on? Or, it's or not, intellectual stuff. It's not and that could actually. Yeah, that's true. So, what about the professional nanny, which you didn't mention? When does, when does that emerge as a, as a kind of professional career or whatever it might be called? I, I, I didn't choose it because, to be honest, I don't know, but I, like, governess and nannies are a bit similar. Yeah, well, so. And, like, like, I know that some governors, as soon as their um, daughters are over 18 and they have their own path, they join her as a friend. Like, the like they're kind of like a nanny. So I think it's, it's just quite a bit of the nanny might be there, might be taking care of of the children, but will not be teaching them. So it's not a, pedagog a pedagogical role then, the nanny? Yeah, no, like for example, in Persuasion we have, there's a scene where um, Mary doesn't want to look after her kid that's ill, and there's, there, there's mention of a nanny there, but she's not like a governess, she's not teaching them, it's just to look after them when they're ill, mm. or just help with around the house. And the nannies in Dickens are kind of charming, illiterate spaces, mm -hmm. they're, 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 they're not there to, they're, they're wet nurses or they're kind of, you know, changing the nappies and all that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah. But, uh, yeah I'm, I'm, as far as the profession of authoress is concerned, I think even by the early 19th century there's a kind of feeling that there is, that there is such a thing, but it's whether it's morally as reputable as it might be, I'm not sure. But someone like Charlotte Smith, for example, who, who um, uh, her husband abandoned her when she had what, nine children or whatever, he was mm -hmm. bankrupt and ran off to France. Mm -hmm. And she was a, an accomplished poet, she was a very well-known poet. She wrote a, the Elegiac Sonnets in the 1880s, so 1780s. But in the 1790s, when her husband's deserted her, she starts to write novels, which sell in large, large, large numbers, and she said, she said, I rather regret having to assume the profession of an authoress mm -hmm. rather than devoting herself to a, the higher art of, of, of poetry. So she kind of sees it as a trade, and she's mm -hmm. kind of anxious about, about, about that, you know, in that kind of way, that, sort of, that, that kind of way in which Byron, for example, would, even though he earned thousands and thousands of pounds from his profession of writing, never pretended, and never actually would acknowledge he was a professional author, it's just a kind of something he did on the side. Yeah. And so, Tell me about Hannah Moore, because you said that aspirational, because Hannah Moore was generally considered a very kind of high Tory conservative mm -hmm. person. Yeah, well, well when I, was, I was reading about um, influences just in the early 18th century, and I came across her and about her, I can't say this, philanthropist, say it's whatever. Um, sure. And even though she was quite conservative, yeah. I think subconsciously, with all the work with religion and this um, failure of, of talking or writing, she kind of maybe not noticed or more subconsciously, but she did give a role to other women to inspire, to to stand up and to do something that was outside the domestic sphere. Mm. So yeah, I mean, she's an interesting figure, really. I mean, I've heard her attacked as the. Is it arch reactionary in terms of mm -hmm. women yeah, writers? Yeah, she's quite conservative and quite traditional, but they're actually... But at the same time? But at the same time, she's like the opposite because she's actually standing for um, her ideas and she's a figure that, like, I think religious is that escapism at, at that time and especially in the 17th, just 17th, eight, late 18th century to actually stand up and be like something outside and that's not class, that's normal. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. There's all those kind of mockeries of the blue stockings which starts in the 18th century. And it kind of tra travels in, even into the later, into the Victorian period as, as well. But there's some, like, some you know, in, in Gilbert Sullivan, it's just that, that singular anomaly, the lady novelist, you know, I'm sure she won't be missed, as if it, somehow it wasn't a woman's role to be, yeah. to be any kind of, a, of a, a writer. Mm -hmm. There's something, mm -hmm. you kind of unsexing yourself by, mm -hmm. by, by yeah. venturing there's forth. Lot, there's also a lot of um, ideas about 
if you dedicated to something like that or you dedicated to something outside of domestic theory, you were not feminine, you were not classified as a feminine. And even like the word spinster, spinster means someone that is a single woman that is not married or does not have children. And I read that sometimes they're not even categorized as women because a perfect ideal image of a woman would be someone married with. I mean, there's a famous uh, late 18th, 18th century satire on Mary Wozencock and other feminists of the period called The Unsexed Females. So if you've taken interest in politics and, and challenge gender roles, what you're doing is unsexing yourself, mm -hmm, yeah. losing your femininity yeah, losing. in that kind of... Yeah. The kind of well, the, uh, the interesting irony in that is that when everyone, when I, when I think about domestic role, it's quite glamorised in some way because it's still, it's, it's still an intense... It's not as intense as maybe a seamstress or working in a factory, but it's still not a glamorized job. So even though it's not, it's supposed to be feminine to stay at home. It, if you portray someone cleaning, someone sweating, and someone taking care about the children and having food all over themselves, it's not quite a feminine image either. So you have these two images of feminine, but you don't quite implement. Thank you. You're welcome. So, okay. Mm.